so good to see you this morning. Uh, yeah, all right. <laughs> Paul, happy Father's Day, everybody. Thanks for the music um, in between. That was a that was good. So, uh, fathers, I just want to say hi to you. Um, and today, I'm going to talk about you a little bit. Uh, and I've been um, actually, you know what? If this morning's a little helter skelter for me, Christine and I just drove over the mountain an hour ago from Idaho came back, and so we're, we're just back to the city, and uh, and I might not have slept a lot last night, but um, finished the sermon, so that's good. All right? So Father's Day, what's that? <laughs> we think, <laughs> yeah, we'll see if we finished it. So um, it's only about 28 pages long, so it should be fine. <clears throat> um, what a blessing it is to be a father, and uh, it's such a blessing to be here with you today. And so Today is June 19th as well, and I was reading a little bit about uh, a man named General Gordon Granger. If you don't know him, he marched into Texas, and Texas was still fighting the Civil War a few months after the Civil War ended. <laughs> and uh, they were fighting the Civil War, and uh, Mr. Granger, actually uh, General Granger, walked into Texas and, go, and basically was like, hey, guys, the war's over, and uh, had to do a little fighting and stop everything, and that's now... Um, has, has been celebrated for actually many, 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 many years, and now it comes to the forefront even more, June 19th being the end of slavery in America, which is a really, really good thing. And it's a good thing because um, humanity, humanity will always, always, always enslave other humans. That's how we are. We love that. We love to take our thumb and put it down on other people. But God is the God of freedom, a God of redemption, the God of releasing um, the, the enslaved, and especially when it comes to the uh, life and who we are as people, um, we are released from the, the slavery of sin and given freedom in him. And so um, when we get to see that on earth happen, it's pretty beautiful and amazing. When we get to see that in eternity, it's going to be remarkable and something that will be um, unimaginable. So <clears throat> um, this morning, I think there are some announcements. You probably saw that. I don't know if there's announcements. I'm sure there is something going on. So, uh, but this morning I'm going to talk about fathers and it is Father's Day and I don't always do a Father's Day message. If you're a mother and you're here and you're going, ah, oh, shucks, I came the wrong day. Uh, go back to Mother's Day weekend. I talked about moms back there. Uh, and so Major uh, General Gordon Granger, as he walked into Texas at some point, he's known as saying this, the battle is neither to the swift nor to the strong, but to him that holds to the end. I love that. I love that in fathers. Fathers, often we think we have to be strong, we have to be swift, we have to be everything. And come to find out, often it's the ones who hold to the end. Because your kids are going to grow up and mature and start realizing some things and come back to your bedside and listen to wisdom. Today, I'm going to talk about fathers. You may not be a father. You may not um, ever, you may never be a father. You may not be capable of being a father because you're a woman. Uh, and, and I know what a woman is, and we all do. But we all have fathers. And if you know Jesus as Savior, you have a perfect father. I want to say hi to those online and everybody here and those who will watch this later on uh, talking about fathers. My goal is that this message is an encouragement. I realize that we didn't all have great fathers. I realize that our fatherhood ourselves, we might be ashamed of our fatherhood. Uh, there's broken families here. There's uh, brokenness here. And, and so a message like this could be discouraging. It could be full of, of uh, um, uh, the enemy pushing shame on you. And I don't mean that in any way. And and I just mean this in, in encouragement to those who are, who are mothers, who are wives, who, who have husbands and have children and, and are trying to fill both roles at some times as well. But fathers this morning, I want to talk to you and future fathers, I want to talk to you and, and fathers online and my father, I want to talk to you. We do not all have good examples of fathers. We have not always been good fathers ourselves. Our fathers have possibly hurt us as we often hurt our kids. But the Bible has a lot to say about fathers. And today, Father's Day 2022, we're going to talk about fathers. So Proverbs 4, verse 1 through 6. Proverbs is full of father's advice to children, to his children. And this is, this is Solomon, the great Solomon, the wise Solomon, who would later on not last to the end. 
and he would still have fatherly advice, and he would say early in his life, my children, listen when your father corrects you. Pay attention and learn good judgment, for I'm giving you good guidance. Don't turn away from my instructions, for I too was once my father's son, tenderly loved as my mother's only child. My father taught me, he taught me to take my words to heart, follow my commands and you will live, get wisdom and develop good judgment. Don't forget my words or turn away from them. Don't turn back, turn your back on wisdom for she will protect you, love her and she will guard you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you that so much of this, this Bible, this book that we have that points to you talks about fathers and it talks about fathers in light of God, our father and I praise you for that. I thank you for the stories throughout this Bible that tell us over and over and over the testimony of fathers who have done well and fathers who have not done well. Fathers who have done both, who have hurt their kids, hurt their families, hurt their, their, their nation. And fathers who have blessed their nation and, and ro- raised up and risen up to a place of, of leadership and a place of, of influence. And I pray that this morning that this would be an encouragement to us. Thank you, Father, for being our big father such a blessing. Uh, you're our perfect father. And as we try to re-understand who you are, uh, understand you as a good, good father, I pray that you would speak to us and teach us through your Holy Spirit. And I thank you for the fathers who are here and the sound of my voice. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would, you would just overwhelm them with your, your hand of, I love you. You're enough. You're, you're doing well. Learn from me gain wisdom, and continue to learn. I pray that these fathers would be encouraged this morning and also that we would hear and maybe shift and change and listen and learn. In Jesus' name, amen. This passage is so fantastic. Proverbs, a lot of Proverbs is the wisdom of a father to a son or sons or children, uh, daughters and sons. And uh, and for, for us to listen to wisdom, and he goes on through the, through the Proverbs, and listen, this is, this is wisdom. These are Proverbs. These are wisdom. Listen to this wisdom. I, and he says, I too, I have, I have good judgment. I have sound judgment, sound guidance for you. My father, he taught me. And so Solomon is talking about his father, David. And he's saying, my father, David, taught me. He's, my father said, take my words to heart. Follow my commands, and you will live get wisdom, pursue wisdom, develop wisdom, pursue wisdom, gain wisdom, not just knowledge, but wisdom, and this will be a blessing. Fathers, you must show up to work. You must show up to work. We do not get a day off. This is the role you have been given as a man in the family and in society. You need to accept the position that's bestowed upon you, and you must show up to work. It's not right is not available to us to not show up and all it does is wreak havoc in this world and in our family media over the years have almost exclusively shown fathers as bumbling fools yet before the 80s that's not how it was it was very hard to find any bumbling fool on tv in media anywhere before the 80s a study that i read recently said that pre-1970s fathers almost never showed were never showed in a negative, foolish light. The 80s, something started to happen, and something started to shift, and about 18% of TV shows and movies showed fathers were stupid and bumbling and, and foolish, and the world began making fun of the father figure over and over and over, and then bake, baking it into our minds. In the 90s, 35, 50 to 50% of the TV shows and media showed fathers in a negative light. By the time we got to the 20s, 50%, 60%, 70% of shows, and it keeps rolling on to show fathers in negative light. Sure, there are good positive father roles in media, but they're very hard to find. And we've seen it over and over and over as dads, bumbling fools who only make messes that mom has to clean up and children roll their eyes at. But dads, you are more than that. You are capable, you're smart, you're strong, you're creative, You're the man in the family who can lead. You are a leader. Even though you almost never see this in media, you are such an important part of your children's lives, who they are and who they will become. You are that Liam Neeson 
figure that will, I will find you and I will find my daughter, my son. I will come after you. Even with society's constant barrage against men, fathers still are super important to the family and everybody knows it. Study after study after study after study tells the story. 100% of studies tell the story of fathers and the value of fathers in a family and in society as a whole. I was reading a book recently, and here's some statistics. 85% of all children who exhibit behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. I'm not disparaging anybody. These are just statistics, okay? Fatherless homes, the effect of fatherlessness. 90% of all homelessness and runaway children are from fatherless homes. This is from the DHS. Bureau of Census, 90% of all homelessness and, fa- and runaway children are from fatherless homes. 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 75% of all adolescent patients and chemical abuse centers come from fatherless homes. <clears throat> 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 80% of rapists motivated by displaced anger come from fatherless homes. of juveniles in state-operated institutions come from fatherless homes. 85% of all youth sitting in prison grew up in fatherless homes or absent fathers. They're 5% more likely to commit suicide, 32 times more likely to run away, 20 times more likely to have behavioral disorders, 14 times more likely to commit rape, 9 times more likely to drop out of high school, 10 times more likely to abuse chemical substances, nine times more likely to end up on a state-operated op- institution, 20 times more likely to end up in prison, and the statistics go on and on and on. Fathers are important. Ladies, men, fathers are important. And we need to raise this level of fatherhood back up to a place of honor and respect that the, that the world has not given to fathers and fathers themselves have not given to themselves. Men, let's do this father thing right. And so I know as I speak, I know I see older men and, than I am and younger men than I am, men who are not fathers yet, men and women, boys and girls who have been hurt by their fathers, those of us who have lost fathers. And I'm speaking in this middle ground of being a father myself, a son myself, speaking to a people that I love and cherish and a city that I love and cherish. And I know that this city needs father figures to step up. There is another reason dads are disparaged at every turn. You see, God describes himself as father. In every aspect of the Bible, God describes himself as a father, a good, good father. But if humans don't understand what a father is and what a father does, their understanding of God will be skewed at best. If all they know of father is a bumbling fool and someone who doesn't know how to tie his shoes correctly and, and kids roll their eyes at, they look at their God, their father, through those lens. God requires more from fathers. He requires to hold up, to be accountable, to hold us accountable in different ways because we show the world the portrait of God. We show our kids a portrait of God. We mo- most often, we most often view God through the lens of our earthly father. Many of you have come to a realization that you indeed view God through the lens of your earthly father. If he was a mean father, we view God as mean. If he was an absent father, we view God as an absent God. If he was judgmental, we view God as a judgmental God. If he was a disciplinarian, we view him as disciplinarian and not loving. If he was not a grace giver, we believe he was not a great, he is not a grace giver. If we believe he was prideful, if we believe he was inconsistent, if we believe he was, he was, if our father was abusive, we believe God is abusive. If our father was caring and loving, we believe God is caring and loving. If our father was generous, if our father was gracious, we, we look at that through God, <clears throat> through the lens of our father. We see God through this lens, right or wrong. That's just how it kind of works. We're children, we're following our fathers. This is how it is. And we will always need to seek out a deeper understanding of God and be around other men in our lives and other father figures in our lives to get a full understanding of God himself. To rewrite the story in our mind's eye of who God the Father really is. 
I personally have discovered God by watching my own father and being a father myself. My dad was not perfect. This is not because he was that perfect person, but because he is humble. He wasn't maybe humble, but he was humbled and he took that and he is humbled. I followed in my father's footsteps, literally. There was times in the mountains, we just got back from Idaho. I got to sit with my dad on the side of the bed and got to sit with him in the living room. One of our favorite spaces as, as kids, as grandkids and great grandkids is to sit in the living room with dad sitting in the chair and just hear the stories again. Yes, again, but that's okay. Because it's those stories that teach us about God. It's those stories that we rehearse in our minds. And one of those stories is, is following dad along the property line. See, my parents uh, moved into Idaho and bought 80 acres of wilderness. There was no roads. There was no electricity. In fact, we were just talking this weekend and showing this little house, probably a 400-square-foot house uh, that we first lived in that dad built with a handsaw. Yes, no power. He built the entire house. He brought wood home from the sawmill that he was working two or three jobs to keep food on the table. He would work at the sawmill, bring, bring the leftover lumber home that they were throwing away in the pile and built our first house out of the leftover lumber and a, and a cross-cut saw and a long-cut saw, right? <clears throat> he would do this, and he would tell those stories, and we would look at those, those pictures. They bought 80 acres for 100 bucks an acre because it was wilderness and nobody lives there. And there, there's a little landing that they put the house. But early on, I'd remember these stories and remember us as children following my dad down the property line as he's searching out the property line. Um, the problem with our land is on a mountain like this, right? Mountain, house, mountain. So we were following the property line down the down, and I think all of us in my memory, you know, my memory is what it was, what actually happened might be something a little different. But and my grandfather always said a good story is worth embellishing. So <clears throat> so we were we were, I'll keep the dinosaurs in the out. So but we were walking down the property line, and dad's trekking on the property line. He had a survey and kind of kind of cut out and we're following him down that property line. There's my dad going through the brush and brush snapping back and us kids following him along. I don't know what order we are in, but what I knew is that he was going and we were following him through the, the forest, through the thick brush, through the, this trail that wasn't a trail and he was going someplace and we were just following. The, the branches would snap back. We would step on a hornet's nest and he would walk over the hornet's nest and the hornet's nest would bite all of us, right? <laughs> he would keep, and he'd turn around. I was like, what's wrong? You know, and I remember those, those trails through the snow that he'd be walking along. We'd try to jump foot to foot to try to get to those long steps in the snow. In Idaho, three or four feet deep and us kids wading through that and trying to get to the steps behind my father, following him literally. So here's, here's just six lessons from the trail, if you will. <clears throat> Water. <clears throat> this drive over the mountain was dry, I guess. So although it was beautiful, have you guys ever driven across Washington? It's remarkable. It's so beautiful. We live in such a beautiful place. From Idaho, across Washington, the mountains, the desert, the flowers, the amazing beauty. But I got to grow up in Idaho in amazing beauty. Number one, fathers, you are assigned to lead. It's an assignment. If you are a father, that assignment has been given to you. Listen to this. If God knew that we would be born before time began, if he knew who we were before time began, began as people, that means he has assigned a father to our lives. Whew. Fathers, you are assigned to lead. So lead. This is huge. You don't get to give up your God-given leadership whenever you feel like it. <clears throat> and don't give up your God-given leadership too soon. We surrender our position. Thank you so much. <clears throat> we surrender our position of leadership to our wives and children often because we don't feel like it. 
because we're pursuing ourselves, because it's not the right timing, whatever it is. Leadership is a selfless endeavor. <clears throat> and if we're following and going into leadership in a, in a selfish endeavor, it won't work <clears throat> for our children. You, see, the thing is, in leadership as fathers, you know where you're going. You, you know the pathway. And my dad going down the property line, he knew the way. At least he, he, he kind of had a better idea than us kids stumbling along behind him with our heads down, looking around. He knew where he was going. Think of Noah in the Bible. <clears throat> Noah in the Bible knew he was the one called by God. And God said, this is what I want you to do. He didn't say that to his children. He said that to dad. And Noah and his wife led his children and their families to build an ark and to get on the ark. <clears throat> Noah was the lead in that. You may not completely know where you're going, but your children certainly don't know where they're going. There will be the right time to allow him or her to lead, of course, as children, but you always, you allow it to happen. Often we allow it to happen too early, and it can cause serious harm. We have things in our mind and people telling us, give your children freedom, let them lead, let them choose. We but we would never do this along a trail of a cliff. We wouldn't say, yeah, go on, lead on. <clears throat> if it was safe, and if we knew that they weren't going to fall to their death or lead everybody else to their death, maybe we would. But in the long run, we're kind of leading that space as well. <clears throat> Take care of your children. We would never allow them to lead along a cliff where there's death. How much more dangerous is life itself? When you do give up leadership or pass leadership on, don't step away fully. One of my greatest mentors in life was a man named Al Jarvanum. I talked about him many, many times. He has passed away now. He would tell me often, it's okay. Because I'd like, Al, Brother Al, you just like go to the church and tell people this and let's lead this. And <clears throat> he would say, no, you know what? God's placed me on the back row. And I'll lead from the back row. And sometimes as fathers, we find ourselves old and bent over and shriveling up, and the place of leadership in the back row is a beautiful, humble place of encouragement and, and sharing leadership, allowing others to lead. Don't abdicate or re relinquish your leadership too soon. If you do, you're not fulfilling the role you've been given. There's a couple priests in the Bible, one's Eli and one's Samuel, and they were fantastic. And they, they led, they, they raised uh, um, the nation up and God, they, they preached and they taught. Something happened in their lives though, right? Anybody know what happened to their sons? <laughs> Both of their sons went ar uh, astray. Both Eli's and Samuel's sons, all, all of their sons actually started taking bribes. They started to abuse the people. Something happened in, in Eli and Samuel's lives where either they relinquished leadership too soon or they didn't continue to lead well. In fact, Eli was reprimanded, Samuel as well, as saying that uh, in First Samuel 8, it says, Behold, you have grown old, and your sons do not even walk in your ways anymore. They are taking bribes and acting unrighteous, like he has given, given up and allowed them. So number two, so the first one is lead. Men, lead. Please be fathers and lead. Number two, be prepared. Lessons from the trail. Fathers, you need to be prepared. You would never go into the wilderness and unprepared completely. Take the time before you start hiking to know where you're going, become a leader, and be a lifelong leader. Parents are the most prideful people I know, guaranteed, right? I mean, parents do not ask for wisdom on how to parent. Christina, I've seen this many times, and when we were young, we probably did the same thing. We love to ask opinions from people who agree exactly with us, but we are never going to ask opinions from parents who don't agree with us and might show us a different way. We love to think that we know everything about parenting, even though we've never done it, but we've seen it. We've seen it on TV. We saw somebody else do it. Parents are so prideful in this, and they, they almost, we almost never ask for help until it's too late. Only ask or we, we just ask those people who agree with us and not those people who disagree with us. I saw my dad learning how to be a father constantly. And even as a young man, I, I talk, my, my, people ask me all the time, hey, did you grow up in a Christian family? I'm like, hmm, I grew up in a, 
a learning to be Christian family. My father gave his life to Christ about 25 years old, and my mother as well, and they had children already. They came out of a, of a kind of a pseudo-Christian environment and, and, and not Christian at all, and, kind of, and, and then started raising parents. I saw them learn. I saw them go places. In fact, some of my favorite memories of sitting in a conference with my dad, side by side, I was probably a young teenager or mid-teenager at the time, sitting in a conference in Spokane, Washington, listening to a speaker talk about parenting, talk about life together. And I was taking notes. I'd look over and see my dad taking notes. And one thing I remember him saying, because I, I printed a lot, capital letters printing, and he goes, you know how to write? Because you probably could write more. <laughs> he wanted me to learn too, to remember things. I saw my dad learn and learn, read and listen to others and read the Bible and pray. I would encourage you fathers to let your kids see you read the Bible and let your kids see you pray. Often we do that in secret, in silence, or maybe early in the morning when they're not up so we can be prepared. And they get up and it's seven o'clock and life just starts going and, and our kids never know that we actually spend time in the word and we spend time praying, except maybe around the cereal bowl. But something I realize of my own father and dad, if you ever watch this, I just want to thank you for the times that I would come downstairs early in the morning at 5.30, 6 o'clock and see my dad on his knees on the couch praying for his family. We need to see this. And men, you need to show this by example that you're continually learning from the scripture and continually pursuing the king. What a beautiful thing is that. And what a beautiful thing to pass on to your kids. Number three, you got to know who's behind you. Often we don't, realize who's behind us. We expect too much of them. We ask them more from them than they can give. And we're hiking through the wilderness, hiking through the snow, hiking through whatever. And we don't realize, we, we don't quite grasp who's behind us. Sometimes we forget that the little feet behind us are, are immature and they can't yet take the steps we're trying to take. And so we're taking these big man steps through the snow and they're bounding, trying to, trying to get to the next one. And all they're doing is stumbling over themselves and, and pushing through. And we need to remember who's behind us. Sometimes we forget the children who follow are, are all different. They're not all the same human behind us. They're different and they receive love differently. Oh, this is hard on a father because we love to give love the way we receive love and all of our kids should accept that. And the thing is, they don't. There's five love languages or a million different love languages if you bring them all together somehow. And all of those kids are different and they receive love differently depending on what's kind of happened in their own personalities and their own gifting that God's given them. You need to know them. Be a student of who your children are. Some are looking at every bug as he passes by and, and stumbling because he's just looking at every single thing. Some are just daydreaming, looking at the sky and Stopping. Some are right there behind dad. I'm following you and I'm, I'm the one. I'll be right there, dad. Some are on the way back home because this is too hard and we're not doing this, right? These kids are different, all of them. And, and we want to parent to the one that is closest like us. That one that's right there and just barreling right behind us. And we're like, come on, the rest of you. Be like, oh, we need to be students of our kids. We need to be students of those around us. And I would say parents, men who are older and are parenting and guiding and fathering other people and, and fatherless kids, we need to be students of these kids. God brings kids to our church that we can be students of and learn and, and understand how they can best receive love and how we can mentor and, and teach and help them as well. Sometimes we forget that these kids who are following us are watching and learning from every single step we take. They might not even know it, but they're learning from everything. Do you realize that most of the stuff, most of my personality, most of your personality, most of the stuff you believe, you don't remember when you started to believe that? You don't remember when that thing shaped you? The things that shape us the most are the things we don't remember at all. It's weird, right? In my mind, I'm like, I want to remember everything. But our kids are learning from every single thing, and they're not even going to remember the every single thing that they're learning. But our moves, our actions, our steps are important. 
your steps are important. Yeah. Number four, I want to encourage you to take shorter steps. <laughs> when we walk too fast or make things impossible, we don't allow for real learning. And instead, we set our children up for failure, thinking they'll never meet the standard that we're walking with. We do this often as men, and it's hard not to because we have a path. We have we want our kids to be like this when they're this old as adults, and so we parent in a way that our steps are just too big for them to take. And I don't mean baby them necessarily. I'm just saying shorten our steps so they can make the step and lengthen our steps when it's time to lengthen our steps. We need to start out with short steps, of course, and then start lengthening. Remember, they don't have the experience you do. They don't have the experience in anything. So slow down and teach as you go. Don't get exasperated. Don't get, don't get impatient with them. Look over your shoulder often to make sure they're still making it. They're still there. I mean, in our family, four, if we made a home with three, we were pretty happy. You know, we, one might just go off to the side. So look over your shoulder. Make sure you know who's there. Slow down and teach. You know, learning math doesn't come by starting with calculus. It starts with one plus one. It starts with items. It starts small. So do that with life as well. You're not trying to get them to be you, to be you. You're trying to get them to be like you. All right? They're not always pets trained by snacks, although we really wish they would be. We wish you could tell them to sit, to obey, to stand, to sit, to do, to be quiet, to be loud. To, here, here's a snack. Do the thing. And you can, you can do that for a long time. And pretty soon, they start having minds of their own. And dogs don't necessarily, unless you have a Boston Terrier. That thing does. Anybody want a Boston Terrier? Uh, no, <laughs> I wouldn't give. I, would, I might give one of our kids away before. But. I'm joking. They know that. So that's the thing. Yeah, you know, sorry. Okay, on, move on. <laughs> They're not pets. You can't train them like that. You train them through example, through the long training. You train them by being there at the end. So as fathers, in Psalm 103, it says this, as fathers show compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. The Lord parents us in the same way with compassion, with taking, allowing time to happen, with allowing us to learn as we go. Allow your kids to learn as they go. Number five, beware of the danger of following. Yes, following is a dangerous game. If you really understand this and you know this, if you followed somebody else, you know that this is a dangerous game. This person I'm following, I've got to trust. This person might make a mistake. This person might stumble. This person might fail. And I'm following this person. Following is a dangerous thing. You're putting your trust in a human, and that, that trust is going to be broken. And these kids are doing a dangerous thing. Think of Noah and his sons. Following was a dangerous thing. They were following their, their father who was following God, and they were being abused from all around by the people of the world. And then at the end, they would see their father fall. Tough. Brutal. Trust. It's so easy for a child to experience. When they're children, they experience it. They experience um, this innocent trust without even realizing it's trust. But it's so easy for a child to experience broken trust because they follow so blindly. Children naturally trust their fathers. They don't even know they're doing it, right? And if we're not careful, that trust is slowly stripped away or broken because of our own selfishness. You know, tr traveling down a trail, there's a, there's etiquette, trail etiquette, right? You never let a branch snap back behind the person behind you. You grab that branch, you follow it, you let it go, or you warn the person, right? And as a father, often we allow branches to snap back and hit our kids all the time. Those branches of our lives that we're not cautious about, we don't realize we're doing it, or we aggressively in our own selfish pursuit are doing it. It may not hit one child, but it'll hit another child. Or it won't want to hit a child when they're young, but it'll hit a child when they're older and they're taller, and that branch will hit them in the face. Our own sin has a way of hurting those who are following us constantly and breaking that trust. It is important for us as men to live righteous lives. It's dangerous to follow because often men are in hot pursuit of self-focused entertainment, 
And when a child gets in our way, we show what's most important. Hmm. Breaks trust. It breaks the bounds of love. Self-focused fathers are hurting their children. You know the phrase, oh, did I dare say this? You know the phrase, I just need some me time. If you're a parent, me time does not exist. That, that's something you've given up. And I understand. I understand what we need. We need some refreshment. We need some time. I get that. If you ever say that in front of, you, in front of your kids, think about you're communicating with your child. Me time? And I'm cautious of saying that because I know a lot of us have said that. I've said it. Do I really need self time without those people that are following me? That's like me stepping off the trail and saying, hey, hold on right there. I'm going to go over here somewhere where you can't see me. You're not around me. What does a, a kid think in their mind about what's going on? If you say stuff like, hey, I'm going to spend some time with the Lord. I'm going to pray. I'm going to um, uh, uh, pursue the Lord. I need some time to think, to understand, to grow. Help your children understand why that time is important. Jesus went away by himself, and that's a huge importance moment. But if it's just about, hey, I just need me time, there's something potentially hurtful to your children without ex explanation. You know, our God is always available. And if our vision of God through the lens of our parents is that God needs a me time away from me, it skews our understanding of God who's always available to us. <laughs> always. Often in me time, we're not available to our kids. Number six, discipleship is an absolute must. A father who spares the rod of, of, of discipline, I'm sorry, discipline, is an absolute must. The rest of it's been about discipleship. Everything is about discipleship. Discipline is an absolute must. A father who spares his rod of discipline hates his children, Proverbs 13 says. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. And our Father God loves us so much, cares for us so much that he's willing to discipline us. The reason we don't like to discipline is because we don't like it. <laughs> it's not enjoyable. And it's true, kids, that it does hurt us more than it hurts you. It pains us. We don't want to discipline. But the scripture is all over the scripture with the stories and the tales and the things in the scripture. It says, discipline your children direct them, put boundaries up. Discipline is really about boundaries. You don't have to go right to um, spanking, right? That's how we do it. We're like, ah, I'm a frustrated spank, spank, spank. Oh, wait, we blow up and we have passion and emotion and we discipline out of passion and emotion and we just ruin the space, the learning space of discipline. That should be the last thing if it happens. It should be the last thing. We can discipline through time and we can separate ourselves and, and sit our kids. We used to do this. Listen, I'm, I am, my, I, my emotions are way over board here. And if I discipline now, it's not going to be good. And, and I think my mother and father did that. They disciplined in the moment when it was passionate and emotional. And those things border on the edge of abuse really closely because we're out of control. We need to be in control. But discipline is important. So don't discipline out of emotion. Instead, discipline when things are calm. And you can talk and you can help them understand why discipline matters. Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction, training and instruction, discipline of the Lord. So children, what does this exasperation thing mean? They're, children are exasperated by double standards. Hey, do what I say, but not what I do, right? They're exasperated in that. They see this truth, and then they hear this, and they're going, wait a second. My mind is exasperated, is divided, is, is at war. We often do not discipline because we aren't disciplined ourselves even. And so we don't pass it. We don't do anything with our kids. And our kids actually desperately, studies show that kids desperately want their fathers to have boundaries for them have discipline for them and teach, teach them to keep those boundaries. There's a study when we were parenting that we read and understood that in, in this uh, um, a university, whatever, I don't even know anymore, but did the study of kids on a playground. Kids on a playground with a fence, kids on a playground without a fence. The kids on the playground without the fence huddled in the playground structures right in the middle of the whole playground. The kids on the playground with the fence used the entire playground and were climbing on the fence. 
there's more freedom when there's boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, some of those are trying to get over the fence. Would have been me. Children feel safe in boundaries. They just do. And so us putting up discipline and helping them, my, my kids following us, following our, our father through the, through the woods and him giving us boundaries of where the trail is and what to do and what not to do and what that is poison oak. Don't touch that. Don't touch that. That's going to hurt. That's a, a bee's nest. Don't go there and poke your finger in that hole. You know, that's a porcupine. Don't go after the porcupine. They don't you know, do this with their quills, but it's nasty when you get involved in one. That's a skunk. Don't approach a skunk. That's a rattlesnake, a timber rattler. Don't go to the rattle. We have, we have discipline for a reason to keep people's uh, kids safe and protected. Children feel safe when they're disciplined and they have boundaries. A child's brain, uh, this is a study I just read, a child's brain is not fully developed and hence should not be given decision-making power over adults. Their frontal lobe is not complete. According to a, a developmental psychologist, children have a magical thinking. That's what dominates the children from two to seven. This magical thinking is what, is what we love about kids, and they're amazed at things. There's wonder in life. But it also suggests that young kids are not equipped to be in charge of big decisions beyond choosing peanut butter and jelly probably. Structure ensures, structure and boundaries ensures predictability and security in a child. It's only after age 12 that a child begins to develop more abstract and nuanced thinking. And many parents today are negotiating with their five-year-olds as if they're many adults and can make decisions outside of the magical realm. They can't. They're, they're not developed. We need to have a gradation of rules of chain, that change and shift over time. And also having boundaries, it just disrupts narcissism and entitlement. When we give our kids a leadership position and the ability to structure his own or her own boundaries, we just teach them how to be narcissistic in their own lives, that everything's about them and entitled to everything. But there's a reason we're fathers. There's a reason we're parents. It's to structure boundaries so they can grow and be safe and secure and free in those boundaries so that they will create boundaries of their own when they're old enough to reason and seek wisdom. At the end of this trail that our fathers have us on, that's the six things. Um, ask me later if you want to know more about that. At the end of this trail, our fathers will watch as we grow and start leading our own kids. Sometimes our brothers and sisters, sometimes other people We'll be leading them down another path with dangers of its own, but now with equipped with wisdom, equipped with our father's leading and guidance. We'll be prepared, and our preparation will prepare the next generation for even more. Fathers, don't step away from parenting. So I've got a little bit more, just a little bit. We need to remember that hurt fathers hurt children say this often when I have someone coming against me and it feels hurtful. I remind myself that hurt people hurt people. And we know that hurt fathers hurt fathers. And there's a lot of hurt fathers, fathers who have been hurt. Often our fathers are blazing a trail for the very first time. He has been instructed by a father who didn't care for those behind him didn't realize, didn't shorten his steps so that they could follow, or he wasn't there at all. And they're going down a path, a trail without a father. These kids are being hurt. But even, even fathers who have it all together tend to hurt their kids. The fact is you're going to take the wrong step at some point, sometimes from self-preservation, sometimes by accident, sometimes from sheer surprise. Your own father often stumbled and fell before you. And you had the, the choice at that moment to, to criticize him and hate him and hold that grudge against him or the opportunity to forgive him. Your dad made incorrect decisions along the way. He often fell. Your dad likely hurt you, maybe accidentally, maybe even on purpose. I know this. 
Your dad will often stumble. You will often stumble. You will often fall. Your dad will often yell at you to hurry up, or stay on the trail, or yell at you to be quiet, or yell at you this, or yell at you that. Your dad will hurt you. He will miss things. He'll say too much. He won't say enough. He'll possibly repeat lessons and stories over and over and over until you're sick of them and you're rolling your eyes. He will do things. He'll forget. He'll accidentally do things. He'll forget that little eyes and ears are watching and listening when he acts as a man, as an adult. And those little watching ears and eyes will see things and understand things at a certain moment in life that will shape them. Sometimes trails will be easy. Some will be extremely, extremely hard. And your dad will struggle more than he won't. And you, likely, will struggle more than not. Likely your dad, if you look up and see him, you realize the struggle. There will be dangers on the trail, and he will blaze the way through mud and rocks and hornets and moose, yeah, distractions and snow, technical climbs and easy hikes. And your father will go. Your father and you will struggle along the way. And that is good. That's a testimony, a story worth telling. But fathers who have been hurt often hurt those following. Children, would you have grace? All of us are children. Do you have grace on your dad? He probably didn't have any clue what he was doing. And yeah, he was a failure at some points. But he was super successful at other points. I chose at one point to just never be upset at my dad for those times. He knows those times. I sat on his bed this last week, just the last few days, as he's on his his last weeks, months of life. I sat back next to him and asked him what he was looking forward to in heaven. He would respond with, you know, seeing Jesus, of course but feeling at peace, feeling at peace. You know why fathers don't feel at peace often? Because everything that we did wrong to our kids is just turning right here, isn't it? It's going over and over and over. And I think looking in my father's eyes, I could see that record being played. He just wants peace from it. And most of it has been forgiven. He's asked for forgiven. He's offered, we've offered grace and forgiveness and he's done a remarkable job. But at one point I just said in my mind, and I've I've never said it out loud, dad. It's like, I don't blame you. You had no idea how to be a parent. He came from an abusive alcoholic family where the dad wasn't around or worse. He was in and out and disappeared for weeks at a time and then wandered back in. He would come in the front door grab a knife out of the kitchen and head off with my mom, my grandmother and my dad as they were running out the back door trying to get in the truck and get out of there. My dad had no clue how to be a dad. No clue, except everything wrong, maybe. So I don't blame you, dad, for anything. I've forgotten. I've forgiven it. And I want to encourage you to have grace on your dads too. And remember that these stories, when they go around, you will have stories that will be just turning in there. The enemy wants you to feel weak. He wants you to feel worthless and shameful. Shameful. It's so hard to parent when we feel shame. The king has forgiven us. Offer it to your kids. And at some point, they'll be mature enough to forgive you as well. Your father has often never done this before. And often didn't even have a good teacher. You may need to go to your father as an adult and have a conversation with him in humility and just come to him and sit on his bedside. And I pray that it's not when he's 82. I pray that it's when it's sooner, when you and him can be friends. Isn't that the goal as fathers, to raise our kids in such a manner that when time comes, we can be friends? You know, we're not friends with the little kids who are following us. It's dangerous to be friends with them. We need to be father. They need a parent in their life. 
But when they get old enough, they need a friend. And if we're friends here, it's going to be hard to be friends here. Don't flip that around. Parent inside of a funnel. Parent in a way that they become friends when you're old. Such a beautiful thing to have a friend as a dad. And I count my father as a friend. Sit next to him, look at him in the eyes and say, you know, dad, you might be thinking about this situation, but I've forgiven you for it. You might be thinking, and even if he's not asking for it. So father, father, father is the most difficult assignment you will ever receive. But it is not too difficult. And the spirit can help you do this. Step into it. As a God, godly man, a godly father, step into fathering. Allow the spirit to direct you and give you the ability to supernatural be a father. It will, it will change you more than anything else in your life. I've seen my dad go from an angry young father who would react and respond in the moment in passion and anger in a marriage that was in turmoil to a humble and generous and kind father who tells the stories of the Carpenter family again and again and again. And we sit there and listen to those stories and we're like, oh, I love this story. I just want to hear it again for the first time because it teaches us about fathering. It teaches us about God, actually. Fatherhood is hands down the greatest crucible in which it forged as we begin to discover our own relationship with our big father. First time I heard this term, big father, I was in London at a, at a mission field for two weeks, and this young lady was there from South Africa. And in her South Africans and her accent, she would say, I'm going to pray to my big father about that. I just love that idea. We have a big father, a big, perfect father, a good, good father, a father who loves us and cares for us. And he isn't imperfect like our human father. He is a big, good father. And, and being a father is like this crucible of understanding the refining of humility. As we see the reflection of ourselves and our relationship to our big father, we see that reflection with our children. In, in no other way can that happen. We see our own rebellion in ways we never did before. We discover love as we have never experienced before. We discover what it's like to love through disobedience and rebellion. Fathers must show up in selfless abandonment. There is no excuse not to do this. Fathers must show up in selfless abandonment. Not only when the fathering is easy, but when the fathering is impossibly hard. We need to show up in selfless abandonment, not only when the kids love you, but when they hate you. We need to show up because this is what our big father does. We need to show up in selfless abandonment when you are the hero and when hero status doesn't matter. You need to show up when your wife adores you, but even more when she absolutely hates you. You need to show up when your child is a straight A student, but even more when he can't figure out how to be a student. You need to show up when there are plenty of finances, but even more when the debt is piling up. You need to show up in selfless abandonment when your girl, your child is compliant, but even more when there's full-on rebellion. You need to show up when you feel like it, but even more when you want to run away, you want to get out of here, you want to go over by yourself and let those stinking kids keep walking down the path. You need to show up. Everything is going right. Oh, it's easy to show up. But we need to show up when everything is going wrong. Fatherhood is the greatest joy and can be the greatest heartache a man will ever experience. What can be more difficult than a father's love being thrown back into his face? What can be more painful than watching a beloved child choose the pathway of pain and suffering and the ways of the world instead of the path of the father? What can be more heart-rending than a child running from the embrace of a father? This is our big father's perspective on us, a heart-rending fatherhood that he gives to us that we realize in humility, this is me. This is me looking at my God. 
This pain is known by our big father. We all have turned from his embrace, chosen to go our own ways, blaze our own path. We don't need him anymore. We have run from his loving embrace and his, and as prodigals, we thumb our nose at him and head out on our own, only to find life has wrung us out and our bodies are pinned down in the barnyard and pig slop of the world. We try hard to look good, to make sure that our big father does it, that we don't need him. We try hard to take care of ourselves and we do it for years. We pretend that we don't need him, but come to find out we need him. We need our father. There he is waiting for us and he's ready to rescue us. The story we tell often around the gatherings to anyone who will listen in the living room with my dad, the stories we tell over and over and over, the kids will fall in love with those stories. And part of those stories is the pain of it all, the brutality of it all, heartache of it all. It's not just all beauty. We were telling some stories just this last couple of days of, of things that we did as kids things you start remembering that were like, oh, why did I do that? Why did I have that argument with my dad that summer in between college and getting married? Trying to go out on my own in my selfishness, not understanding my dad's care and love and compassion. Oh, I'm sorry for that. I don't want that. The story we tell is important, though. They demonstrate our father's love. <laughs> my dad tells a story. It's when I was little. I was on the back of the pickup truck and we were up in the wilderness and he had these blocks and he was stacking them. And I hear this story of him telling us, I hear my dad, all oh, his love. When I was a young, I didn't really understand this because of the other things that were going on. But he would see me on the back of that truck and had, there's some blocks down here. And he, and he got into the truck. He looked in the rear view mirror and there I was laying under the back wheel. Oh, he thought he killed me. He jumps out of the truck. He runs back. He picks me up. And he thought he ran over me. He, and he, he grabs me and has me under his arm. He runs to the house. And I come to, it looked like I just fell off the back of the pickup and hit my head on a rock, which I would end up doing several times in my life. But my, my dad's heart, right? In the difficulty of being a young father and not knowing how to father, oh, he loved me. He loved me. I remember back at that. It's so important for me to remember that story. Because all those other things the enemy wants to tell me about my dad didn't love me. It's not true. It's not true. There's a story we tell often. It's in the lower part of the barn. There's an old tractor there, a Model T tractor my dad had sitting out there or something like that. And we were out there playing in it. There's a pile of boards over here. And in that pile of boards was a, a wasp nest, you know, a big wasp nest. And we were playing out there anyway. What did we care? We were in the tractor, and pretty soon my sister starts screaming. I don't remember how it all went down, but she's screaming, and the boys, we were looking back, and there was this swarm of black hornets around her head. It looked like Winnie the Pooh. I mean, there it was. And we were screaming. She was screaming. She didn't know what to do. She was frozen. My dad heard it from the house, from the barn, something. My dad ran down. <laughs> wow. And he ran into the hornets. He grabbed her and took off for the house with her, with all of us running behind him fast. Those hornets were in a cloud. And he ran and rescued her, went into this and rescued her. I remember that happening in the river also on an inner tube trip. But my dad going in and rescuing the child that was being swept away by the river. I'm done. Zach Williams says this. There I was. Oh. <sighs> there I was, empty-handed, crying out from the pit of despair. There you were in the shadows, holding out your hand. You met me there. And now where would I be without you? Where would I be? Father, you were the voice in the desert calling out in the night of, in the dead of night, fighting my battles for me. You are my rescue story. 
you lifted me up from the ashes and carried my soul from the death to life. Bringing me from glory to glory, you are my rescue story. You are, you are my rescue story. You were writing the pages before I had a name. Before I needed grace, singing songs of redemption. Because every time I ran away, you were louder than my shame. And now where would I be without you? Where would I be? Father, you are the voice in the desert, calling out in the dead of night, fighting my battles for me. You are my rescue story. Lifted me up from the ashes, and carried my soul from death to life, bringing me from glory to glory. You are my rescue story. You never gave up on me. Oh, that's remarkable. You almost have to say it again. You never gave up on me. You are my testimony. You're my story. You never gave up on me. You never gave up on me. You are my testimony.